Power by Ecotech. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. This is our second q and I'm Tommy and we're back again with Josh and we're answering your questions uh, that you responded to on our YouTube community tab for our second Q&A. Mm -hmm. And the theme is actually, we got a ton of questions. This theme is one of Josh's favorites. It's about lighting. I do like lighting because it's super controversial. Perfect, so it's right up, right up our alley. And uh, another Josh asked this question. Josh, Josh the Box. Josh the Box, great name. Uh, his question is, do you guys prefer white dominant or more blue dominant spectrum? I don't think it's any secret here. We use a lot of blue. We could talk a little bit about the concept behind that. Most of the tanks that we have in our shop, and we're gonna speak specifically about World Light Corals because everybody okay. does things different, right? And Sounds nobody's good. doing it wrong. Some people do it better than others. In our, in our case, we try to accommodate a lot of different type of coral in one shop. So we do use a lot more of a predominantly blue spectrum because it gives the coral a chance to really recover, so to speak. The, the white light tends to be a little bit more harsh on the coral, um, and we can only do that for a shorter period of time. It's kind of like okay. working out really, really heavy. You gotta have that rest period. I don't know gotcha. anything about that, but I assume. Um, <laughs> but anyways, I, you know, here we don't, we don't do a lot of white lighting because most of these corals are gonna be found anywhere from, let's call it 20 feet to 60 feet deep. And those corals at 60 feet, they receive a, a very short photo period. You know, and I think you and I talked about it before mm -hmm. at one point in time. Let's say these corals are at 60 foot of depth and there's a, a, a hill on this side or a mountain side on, or a mountainscape on the other side. If that sun is rising here, it's only getting down to that depth for a shorter window. You know, maybe the, the coral head, maybe the, the actual reef is in the way. Whereas some of those corals that are found in that lower reef slope, they don't get that light like that, the ones up high do early on. So mm -hmm. that's the concept. Whether that's true or not, I, I don't know, but we feel that's applicable, you know. So corals like um, Leptoceris or even a Santorina or something that's gonna be found in the lower areas of the tank, some of your mushrooms, even though some of those are found in the top. Um, we focus on blue specifically because the corals look better, in our opinion, under Makes the blue pop. light. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I love the blue. What about you? Yeah, I love the fluorescence. I think I think everyone's attracted to that, that look, and, and that's been probably over the last decade we've seen more and more blue spectrums in aquariums, right? Living art. Exactly. So, yeah, the, the blue spectrum looks better on the coral and the white's harsh on the coral, so we try not to subject it to too long of that photo period. I think that's a really great point because Josh is taking it back to when you're actually diving or, you know, obviously not many of us have actually visited the, the reef or a real living reef, but the concept that you're talking about, how this, the sun and the lighting moves over time, it's, it's really not getting blasted. Like, if you just buy a light out of the box, turn on 100%, you, you could be in big trouble. Yeah, I think, I think it's important to think really hard about the coral and potentially where they live in the wild, you know, and that's part of what we do here. The, the, the in-between period of a coral coming from the wild, adapting to captivity, and then becoming a sustainably aquacultured coral is a process. You know, through that process, we do a lot of considering of how they're found. You know, Acropora, we know are, they're at the top of the reef. Mm -hmm. right? right? You see them with, with a ton of swimming fish, with leathers, with clams, you know, so you're not going to find an acanthophilia right in the top of the coral colonies with the Montipora and the Acropora. That's a good point. Yeah. Sammy31D says, over many years, um, he whittled the white to only see about, th I'm guessing he's saying three or four hours of white with the rest of heavy blue for a total of 12 hours. Mm -hmm. Everything's been great, no issues, but he was wondering if, um, even if he did two hours, he thinks everything might be even happier. So what, what do you aim for on the, the white spectrum, the white photo period? So in our most Acropora dominated aquariums, I think we have a six hour photo period of white. And okay. then out of the same 12 hours that he's using there, um, six of it's white, the rest of it's solid blue, again, for that visual appeal. Um, but then you can go into our farm and we have tanks that are all blue, 
You can find tanks that are maybe only two or three hours of blue. You can also find tanks that are very, very minimal white, maybe five or 10 percent. But the same concept, using only three or four hours of that photo period. Gotcha. You know, and cool. a lot of that, a lot of that depends on the coral itself. You know, we we tried to think too hard about things. I think as a hobbyist. Um, our real focus should be how the coral reacts. So a lot of what we do is trial and error and understanding what a coral looks like at its best and understanding what a coral looks like at its worst. If you know what that looks like, then you know to shoot for that middle ground and try to find the best possible scenario for the coral. And a really cool thing that really goes to what Josh was saying, because you got in a little bit about the percentage of white that you're using, mm -hmm. is we actually have the schedules. If you're running an Ecotech uh, device or an AI device, we have schedules on our website that mm -hmm. pretty much are from what we're running on the tanks at Worldwide Corals, correct? Yeah, correct. And, and if you ever get a chance to come to our facility, you can always ask any of the representatives here if you can have a photo period or a, uh, how do you want to call it, a template of the tanks that they see you know because that's awesome you know it kind of goes hand in hand with what we were talking about um the last time when we said you know get with somebody that you really trust or you value as a hobbyist and try to follow those same kind of concepts we're not asking anybody to do things the way that we do but if you see a beautiful aquarium chances are that lighting schedule probably works so there's nothing wrong with asking for that profile because it's something that we're full transparency with and we have no problems giving that to any of our customers. So Josh is saying there's a lot of ways to do things. Uh, he's not pointing out what's exactly right or what's wrong. It's just this is the worldwide corals way and we've been you know, pretty successful if you check out some of our tanks. So that leads us into another topic that um, sometimes I think we try to avoid exact numbers and being exactly specific, but uh, Ted wants to know what is low, what's your concept of low, medium, and high par at Worldwide Corals? So he wants to get into more of par numbers because he, see, he sees a lot of people say high par, medium par, low par, but what are, the, what are those actual numbers? So rather than, again, like you were saying before, rather than saying what's right or wrong, let's talk about the Pentagon, for example. Okay. Okay. In the center of the tank, at the peak of any of the rock structures where we have the Acropora, the tank runs 200 par. So I think we might have seen above the rock structure a 220 or something to that effect. I think okay. you and I did that at one point in time. I remember, yes. Um, but that is a complete mixed reef. That's got acros, it's got a mangrove in it, it's got mushrooms, it's got uh, an Acropora. So it's got a little bit of everything. The farthest reach, I think we, we went all the way out to 80 par. And then I think in the front panel, right along the front rock edge was 120 at the sand bed. So in a nutshell, if it's an LPS or a mixed reef tank, you could go as low as 80 in the corner and as high as 200, 220 at the peak, and you're gonna grow beautiful corals. Um, Sammy 31 d had asked in that last question, you know, about the, the, the lighting schedule. We find that as long as you don't punish the coral with too much light, you're gonna actually get a better color coral. And part of the reason why we do that in our display tanks with lower lighting is because we don't necessarily want the coral to grow super, super fast, which is what a prolonged and high intensity photo period is gonna do for a coral. We want it to look nice. And for most hobbyists, I think that's probably the same case, right? So yes. instead of going way overkill with it, which a lot of people like to do, that's a human nature thing, right? Right. Tone it down some, figure out where that bottom mark is and slowly work your way up to the point that you're happy because the corals are gonna tell you if they're happy by color and by gro growth. So let's say you have, uh, you, you went went to the store, bought online a brand new LED lighting device. You don't have access to a parameter. And I'm guessing out of the box, it could be at 100%, but where do people start? Because 100% could be way too much, right? Yeah, uh, a lot of times it's way, way too much. I don't think we have but maybe one tank here that we keep at 100% overall intensity. So honestly, 
start at that 40% range. If the light is too big for the aquarium, based on the manufacturer specs, then go even lower. But there's nothing wrong with starting at 40%. And that's, that's an overall intensity is what we're talking about. We're not talking about blues, the we're channels. not talking about yeah. whites. Yeah, the specific diode colors, most manufacturers, uh, let's use Ecotech or AI for an example, they have templates based on an SPS tank, a mixed reef, a softy tank. Those are all useful tools. Pick a spectrum, which is the template, set the intensity at 40, start from there. But don't go any faster than two weeks at a time because otherwise you're not gonna know if the coral's telling you it's unhappy. So too many variables at one time, or it's a recipe for disaster. And that's great advice, because I don't know if you guys picked up on it, but Josh said, give it a couple weeks. So, you know, you're not changing the intensity the next day, mm -hmm. messing with it. You really want your corals to tell you what's going on in the tank. Uh, just give us a quick example of a coral that's not happy. What, what is it gonna do? Most of the time, let's, let's use an example. Um, so anthids, they could either lay completely open with a pale colored oral disc mm -hmm. and show no color at all because they're just getting pounded by the light or some of them will close up and they'll never open but that's a result of a change so if the coral was always open and you put a new light on the aquarium and now it's closed we know something to do with that is the the, the change right so we're looking for reactions more than anything Awesome. So you're letting the corals do the talking, basically. Absolutely. So let's move into an, an, the next question uh, from Todd. He's curious to know that, let's say he has a lighting solution. It's already programmed for optimal spread, spectrum, duration. He knows the power values. He's confident with this lighting setup. Is following everything that um, you know he's been told to do. Um, at that point, is there a reason, or is it likely the reason that someone can't keep a coral alive? Like would is there something he's missing in the lighting that, that could be a reason that, you know, he's having corals die? No. I mean, that's probably the most definitive answer I could give. I don't generally like to say no, because no is a one-sided thing. But, mm -hmm. you know, you can grow a coral under an incandescent light. It may not be optimal, it may not look good, but it can stay alive. Yeah, that's crazy. You know, so <laughs> the, the point is, kind of similar to what we were just talking about, Make sure you do the same thing with your tank all the time. If you're gonna make a change, make a change, give it a couple weeks and don't be afraid to give it a month, but one change at a time, that way you look for a reaction. And that reaction, if it's not there, then you know that it wasn't a poor decision, right? So every good decision in a reef tank usually shows very little to no result, okay? And, and that's just from our perspective. Anytime we make a change and it's too much of a change, it's usually for the worse. Um, there are times where it's better, but those, those changes for the better are very incremental unless it's in a terrible environment currently, right? Um, very, very slow, take your time, make one change at a time, look for a reaction, react to the reaction, and the lighting is probably not your problem, honestly. We, I don't know if you ever did back in the day, but uh, Reef Bright was very, very popular at one point in time for um, accent lighting with T5s or uh, metal halides. But I was dealing with heat for a while in, a, in one of the aquariums that I had, and it was metal halide, um, and I just shut them off. I got busy with life, I got busy with work, and next thing you know, I'm like, man, I haven't had my halides on for weeks. And you know, I cleaned the glass in my aquarium because it was nasty and I looked at the coral and they were amazing. But they were surviving. So, so my point in telling that story is that they're extremely survivable. You know, we're not good at acknowledging the things that they're telling us. So mm -hmm. don't focus so much on the lighting. Pick something, stick with it. Let it run its course. If it's doing good, then leave it alone. I mean, that's the answer to me. I mean, he threw, he threw it way back. You gave me, <laughs> you had me start thinking because back in the day I had, I think I had a 400 watt metal halide set, set up with some VHOs or T5s as Atenix. And when you had too much metal halide, you just turned it off. You yeah. couldn't, they didn't have uh, until later on, you couldn't dial in the, uh, how much water, how much uh, 
um, output oh, it was the producing. Galaxy Select a while back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I didn't have that. So if you had a problem with the lighting, you just turn it off. So I think maybe some people are just going too high in the lighting, running the photo pe period for too long, or uh, just experiencing problems that way because they think just out of the box it's going that. So hopefully you guys picked up on some information uh, that Josh sh shared with you because it's probably one of our most talked about subjects at, at Worldwide Corals. And that leads us into the last question from Fish Pony. And we see you, Fish Pony. Thanks for watching, always commenting. He's got a really good question. It's about lighting duration and how does it directly affect the consumption of calcium and other elements in the aquarium? So um, I guess this one's probably an easy one to answer because it's not a lot of speculation here. Um, okay. If the corals photosynthesizing, it's going to be doing a lot of those metabolic processes, right? So it's digesting, it's growing, all that affects what we put into this glass box of water. You know, those, those elements are in the salt. They're also there because we're putting them there, but they're also being consumed by the coral. So that process is either expedited or retarded because of the environment that it's in. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of things can affect those values. And, you know, we've talked about those things in the past too, phosphates or just simply dirty water, not taking care of the aquarium, all that can slow things down, not using those minerals. But in an ideal situation, when the water quality is good, the lighting is right, and the coral is genuinely happy, it's gonna burn through a lot more of those materials, whether it be food, whether it be calcium or alkalinity or magnesium, all that is a process. So yeah, they need them, so they're gonna use them. Just like when you drive your car, you gotta fill it up or charge it nowadays. <laughs> exactly. So you're saying as it, basically as the coral, if your tank's happy and the corals are growing, mm -hmm. they're gonna be depleting those elements, so. Yeah, for sure. You see zoanthid polyps opening up on different areas of the rock that you didn't have before, mushrooms multiplying, or, or acropora with those really nice, beautiful tips. That's, that's all gonna be growth. That's a great point too, is that maybe you don't have to crank up your lighting maybe you have to work on your your water quality or clarity because if you maybe you just need to throw some carbon in there clean clean up the look of the water so that the the light can penetrate to the corals better honestly that's the most impressionable thing that i think that that we could talk about today is the fact that do things right and quit focusing on the lighting because honestly we forget about some of the schedules that we change and they're not perfect. But the corals don't die. But they do tell us they're not happy. So do the right thing. Do things the same way every time. Don't do it fast. Don't focus so much on the lighting and you'll be a happy reefer. Awesome, great, great questions everyone. We really appreciate it. Uh, for the, you know, keep a lookout on our YouTube community page for the next round of questions that we're gonna do for our part three of our Q&A. Uh, thanks again, Josh, for the time. If you enjoyed this video, Please like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.